Hi there, and welcome to our second webinar in the Parkinson's Foundation's 10th Expert Briefing Series. Uh, the topic of for today is advanced PD and palliative care in the 21st century. I'm uh, Dr. James Beck. I'm your host uh, for today's discussion and uh, Chief Scientific Officer at the Parkinson's Foundation. Um, what I always like to tell our audience before we uh, start these webinars is that this is our 10th one, and we've been doing this a while. And, and the reason I think they've been so successful is because we've gotten fantastic feedback from the community um, and helping to create this. Uh, we have a, a, every year we always uh, have a survey, and so keep that in mind as we generate one for our 11th year. We also really depended upon um, regional Parkinson's organizations, our Alliance of Independent Regional Parkinson's Organizations, or AIRPO members, who help also uh, guide the direction of, of these webinars. So thank you all to the community for that. Um, if you want a PowerPoint uh, presentation that you can uh, download on your computer to look at later, you can do so. Um, if you're looking at the viewing page right now, right under uh, Dr. Miyazaki's uh, picture, there's a nice blue box that says download slides. So just click on that download the slides, and then you can have a, a PDF uh, to refer to um, whenever you want to. Um, if you're a health professional who's joined us um, for this uh, uh, webinar series, you can earn one free CEU um, through the American Society of Aging. If you registered as a health professional, of course, um, and you've indicated you want a CEU, you have to uh, do so, you'll, and when you do, you'll get an email by the end of the day with steps on how to collect that CEU. Keep in mind, you only have 30 days with which uh, to collect that CEU. So that's till December 27th, um, and then you can uh, get that uh, CEU. And so now uh, it's my real distinct pleasure to introduce and welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Janice Miyasaki. She's the director of the Parkinson and Movement Disorder Program at the University of Alberta in Canada. Um, you know, Dr. Miyazaki is a, is a previously graduate of University of Toronto, where she completed her medical school and residency under the auspices of uh, Dr. Anthony Lang. Uh, Dr. Lang is a, a world-renowned uh, movement disorder neurologist, uh, as is Dr. Miyazaki. And she joined uh, University of Alberta Faculty uh, of Medicine and Dentistry in, in 2014 after uh, spending uh, 22 years in Toronto. Um, since uh, 2015, uh, Dr. Miyazaki has become the Director of Movement Disorders Program and has 10 physicians, seven neurologists, a neurosurgeon, neuropsychiatrist, geriatrician, a real dedicated interdisciplinary team uh, that's there to take care of, of Parkinson's disease. And we're going to learn more about that in just a second. Um, she's held uh, leadership positions at the University of Toronto, at Al University of Alberta, and part of the Movement Disorder Society and Parkinson Study Group and American Academy of Neurology. She's very involved with um, not only uh, research but also academic medicine uh, side of things. What She's, what reason she's speaking here today is that she founded the very first dedicated palliative care program for Parkinson's disease um, at University of Toronto in 2007, really ahead of her time. And since then, she's published a tremendous amount of research on this topic, has received funding from our foundation to help um, really explore uh, palliative care in Parkinson's disease space. And in 2015, she established the uh, Complex Neurologic Symptoms Clinic um, at the K. Edmonton Clinic in University of Al Alberta. Uh, along with uh, Dr. Wendy Johnson, is, who's an expert in ALS. The goal of this program is to provide care to neurologic patients with palliative care needs. Um, and as part of this effort, what she's done, she's been a wellspring of, of, of resources to the community as a whole. And, and um, as a result of this initial work, several centers uh, are, with dedicated palliative care programs have sprung up throughout North America and throughout the world. So, um, again, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Uh, Miyasaki. Janice? Thank you, Dr. Beck. And thank you all for registering and showing your interest in palliative care as it relates to Parkinson's disease. Through this webinar, um, I would like you to be familiar with some of the symptom burden for people with Parkinson's disease that is less traditional and outside of the scope of purely motor symptoms alone and also to be able to answer the question, what is palliative care and is it for me? And then an important aspect of everyone's healthcare portfolio is having advanced care directives. What are they and why you should choose to have them? So one of the challenges for people with a chronic condition is the North American narrative of success. 
we really prize the individual, someone who is strong and independent, and that when you work harder, good things happen to you. And so when you don't work hard, clearly bad things happen. And this is really challenging for those with a chronic illness because your symptoms are often progressing despite the best medical management, despite your best efforts, and it can make people feel like a failure. And a good lesson for us to remember is when you only have a hammer in your toolbox, everything is a nail. So just working harder, just trying harder, just exercising six hours a day, this is not going to address all the symptoms related to Parkinson's disease. And this is part of the reason why I felt the palliative care principles would be useful for people with Parkinson's. So how can we get a better toolbox for our patients? I always recommend that patients who attend our clinic be informed. Go to really reputable websites. I also encourage people to bring a spouse or a relative to visit. There are several reasons for this. One is that you may see, see things in a different way than your spouse or relative does. Your spouse or relative may have questions that's important to be answered for you to have the best quality of life at home. And secondly, doctors talk pretty fast and they use really big words. So it's useful to have another set of ears to remember what happened in the appointment. It's helpful to write down questions in between appointments because when the doctor says, do you have anything else you want to ask? Inevitably, people say, I did and it's left my mind. And write down the answers if your doctor does not provide information for you in a written format at the end of the appointment. Ask for clarification. Don't be afraid. If you don't understand what they're saying or the words that they're using, say, you know, could you go over that again? I'm not really getting the point that's important for me to remember. And also to be out there, to be engaged, be social and be frank and honest about what's happening to you. Um, sometimes I get the feeling that patients want to be a good patient. They want me to feel that I'm doing a good job, so they tell me everything's A-OK. -okay. But I need to hear the truth if I'm going to help them live the best possible life. I would also consider bringing the non-motor questionnaire to your visit completed. So this is a simple questionnaire, it's yes or no, and you can see that many of these symptoms you might be experiencing. Often doctors are not aware that these symptoms are associated with Parkinson's disease. So if you bring them to your family doctor, your internist, your geriatrician, or your neurologist, this can help start the conversation about other symptoms that require um, treatment or investigation. And this is just the second page of that questionnaire. It's important to note that not everyone will experience all these symptoms because some of them sound pretty frightening. So it's just a list of, of symptoms and it helps your neurologist or your physician know what's going on with you and help you with these symptoms. It all can also direct us to change your Parkinson treatment. Now, one of the myths that I want to dispel is that palliative care and hospice care are equal. And so people often associate palliative care with end-of-life care, which according to the United States um, Medicare guidelines, hospice care is given to people in the last six months of life. And palliative care is something different. And this is what we're trying to promote. The palliative care approach and the palliative care philosophy in addressing people with chronic conditions. 
And so what can palliative care provide? It provides relief from pain and other distressing symptoms. You've seen from the non-motor symptoms questionnaire that people, in fact, suffer from pain and other symptoms that are not purely motor. It affirms life and regards dying as a normal, normal process. I think often in modern society, we have started to view death as optional, that technology can take over everything for us. But unfortunately, this is not true. I think what we need to emphasize is the quality of life and that people enjoy their life and their family and friends and their social interactions as much as possible and that we maximize that quality of life for every person for every day. It intends neither to hasten or postpone death. It integrates psychological and spiritual aspects of patient care. And I think this is one part where the high technology really falls down, um, that many patients do express that they can't talk about their despair, sometimes hopelessness, uh, sometimes feeling demoralized despite their best efforts that their illness is progressing. And that um, either these words or these feelings are not heard or acknowledged or that there's discomfort from their uh, neurologist in dealing with this. But palliative care embraces this. This is part of the experience of having illness and that we have to help our patients in coping with this. It also offers support to help the family cope. And those of you who have tuned into this particular topic are probably very well aware of the demands of caring for a loved one with Parkinson's disease. I often say to my palliative care colleagues that people who have cancer often have a very predictable course and it's often uh, very limited. For people with Parkinson's disease, this is an illness that goes on for decades and so requires decades of caregiving that shifts slightly as time goes by. And so we have to address the distress of our uh, spouses and families for people with Parkinson's because if they are doing well, then the people with Parkinson's do better. And I think this has been often neglected because in my clinic several times, spouses will tell me this is the first time anyone's asked me how I'm doing. So we have to be better at looking at our unit of care as not being just the person in the seat who has the diagnosis, but in fact their entire family. It uses a team approach to address needs. So I am a neurologist. I am a movement disorder neurologist. My particular expertise is in dealing with movement disorders. I have a palliative care physician who sees patients with me. Her expertise is different. It is truly about the end-of-life care and about dealing with pain and breathlessness and other symptoms that often happen at the end of life. And then we have a spiritual counselor in the United States is often called pastoral care. Um, and the spiritual counselor addresses some of the other suffering that occurs when you have a chronic condition, and we'll go over that in later slides. Palliative care can also enhance quality of life and may positively influence the course of illness. There is a famous study that occurred just about seven to eight years ago, and it looked at people with metastatic cancer. And those who were randomized to early palliative care, in fact, had enhanced quality of life and they had longer survival than the people who were getting aggressive chemotherapy. 
And probably it's because the palliative care team was addressing all their symptoms, not just looking at a single marker or a single blood test, but looking at the whole person and addressing all the symptoms and suffering. And this is an important concept that has been added in the past five years for the World Health Organization definition of palliative care. It is applicable early in the course of illness. And why do we say that? Um, I had a graduate student who did uh, some research on people who had just been given the diagnosis of Parkinson's. And often they're given the diagnosis in a pamphlet and sent on their way. At that time, your whole life has shifted. You went in being a person who was in a perfect state of health. And you left being told you had a chronic progressive neurodegenerative disorder. And in the words of a patient, there are no good words in that phrase. And yet we expect patients to go with their prescription and their booklet and make their way until their next appointment, which is often three months to six months down the line. And so having access to palliative care, and in particular the spiritual um, counselor, can help people process that information, help them address their distress, and feel positive about going forward because that's what we want our patients to be able to do. And so we see here that the original palliative care and hospice movement, and the hospice movement was developed in uh, the UK by uh, Dame Cicely Saunders, who wanted to address the suffering of people with incurable cancer. And then it became adopted in Canada, in Quebec, uh, by a urology uh, surgeon who wanted, again, to address the suffering of men with incurable prostate cancer. But we have now evolved the concept of palliative care, where it's just end-of-life and cancer-focused, to in the 21st century, where it is applicable throughout a disease trajectory and now is being increasingly adopted for those with chronic illness, not just Parkinson's disease and multiple system atrophy or progressive supranuclear palsy or dementia, but also uh, kidney failure, heart failure, and lung diseases. And in fact, neurologic uh, diagnoses are now overtaking many of the cancer diagnoses as the commonest cause to access hospice care in the United States. So our program, um, as Dr. Beck mentioned, began in 2007 at the University of Toronto, and I restarted a new program at the University of Alberta in 2015 and follows the principles of palliative medicine in collaboration with palliative care, spiritual care, and neurology. And I think that um, multiple discipline approach is really important for us as a group. And we see patients as a group, and I think that has elevated all our practice skills. And one of the tools that we use that you could also print up and use is the Edmonton Symptom Assessment Scale. And this is used for people with cancer, but some of the symptoms you can see are relevant for people with advanced uh, Parkinson's disease. So pain, fatigue, drowsiness, nausea, losing your appetite, shortness of breath, depression, anxiety, and a sense of well-being. And then we adapted it to include other symptoms like stiffness, constipation, swallowing problems, and uh, cognitive clarity. And sometimes patients and their uh, families just get really weary with all the paper that we um, throw at them in the clinic. And why do we like these scales? Well, if, if you don't ask, 
we won't know what's happening to you. And it's really hard for people with Parkinson's and their families to know what is related to Parkinson's and what isn't. And it would be a tragedy for people to persist with their symptoms in the community and not really have the treatment that they need to have and that could benefit them. And so that's why it's important to ask these questions, even though they're boring, even though they're repetitive, because one day you may answer yes, and your neurologist may have a solution for that. Now, I wanted to address some symptoms that can be problematic and are non-traditional for Parkinson's disease, one being pain. So um, it is important that your Parkinson medications are optimized in, uh, for people with Parkinson's, but also for people who have Parkinson-like syndromes, because many of these patients can respond to levodopa. It's also important to uh, use exercise. And range of motion exercises are very useful to help reduce the pain because the sources of pain are not just related to wearing off, but if you think about it, if you imagine your loved one with Parkinson's who is less mobile, when you sit in a cramped airplane seat and you don't move for hours, when you get up, you're sore and stiff. It is harder for you to move. And that is how they're spending all their day. So if we can do range of motion exercises, that can help them. If, they, if the person with Parkinson's can't do their own range of motion exercises, then doing passive range of motion, that means where the spouse or family member does the range of motion for the person can help. Botulinum toxin has also been used to treat pain in Parkinson's disease. And finally, if all these measures are either not working or not appropriate, then considering pain medication as a last resort should be considered. And so these are just some of the passive or active range of motion exercises that can be done. I, I will admit that some of them are quite ambitious, particularly the one in the lower right-hand corner. But if you can at least get the person moving like that, you can see how it can relieve some of the lower back pain. And if you are prescribed pain medication, um, we're all aware of the opioid uh, epidemic in uh, the United States and in Canada. And so we are always trying to use the mildest medication or the mildest treatment for pain, but use it effectively. So the important concept of pain management is that you take your pain medication if your pain is present for 70% of the day or longer, that you take it around the clock. Because if you wait until the pain is unbearable, you will have to take a larger dose to get control of the pain, and then you will have more side effects related to that. So it's better to take it around the clock. This is often challenging for people with Parkinson's because you're already taking so many pills, and it just seems like such a burden to take another set of pills. But if you take pain medication effectively, it can help people be more alert, more interactive, more willing to go out and socialize, but also more willing to exercise. It is very rare that people would need medications on the far right-hand screen. But when they do, I find that um, my Parkinson patients can take the lowest dose and cut that tablet in four, and they just take one quarter twice a day, and they are doing marvelously well and never escalate their use. So if you are prescribed your pain medication, please take it as prescribed. This slide just highlights some of the information that I've gone over. And 
the one uh, limitation for pain medication is that the drowsiness and cognitive clarity can be impaired by uh, the use of opioid medication. And so that always has to be balanced. And doctors should always be listening to patients and their families about the desired amount of pain control versus, versus the desired amount of cognitive clarity. Now, here's a topic that I never thought I would speak so much about being a brain doctor, but I do every day. This is the Bristol stool chart. And so you can all internally think what your bowel movement today looked like. What we're aiming for is type 3 or type 4. And you should be able to have a bowel movement every day or at most every other day. If your stool looks like type 1, this is not good. And if it's uh, type 2, that's also less than optimal. Often when people are having very severe constipation, they will also have back pain, and they will also occasionally get diarrhea because they're getting overflow. And there are many reasons why I obsess about people's stool. And it's because it causes my patients suffering. They have bloating, stomach pain, back pain. They can have hemorrhoids. But most importantly, your medications will not work properly because you do not get your medications absorbed. And often appetite is lost, and people will lose weight when they become very severely constipated. And the good things about a daily poo is that your pills work better, going to the bathroom isn't a chore, your diet is probably better, and your appetite improves. And there is evidence that if you have a good diet and you're having a daily bowel movement that you reduce your cancer risk for bowel cancer. And so remembering those principles of starting with the most conservative treatment, that is non-pill treatment first. Um, drink enough water, eat watery fruit, eat raw vegetables, less meat, more beans, no white rice, bread or pasta, and using whole grains only. And dried fruit seems to be a, a very high source of fiber that is natural. And exercise. Exercise will help with constipation. So once again, if the person with Parkinson's is not able to do exercise, having some passive range of motion will help because think about people without Parkinson's. You're always moving, you're bending over, you're picking up things, and that helps to massage your bowels. Or you can do abdominal massage, which uh, was found to be very effective in constipation for people who were taking opioids for their cancer treatment. Unfortunately, you have to have your tummy pressed on 10 to 20 minutes per day for this to be effective. And then if that doesn't work, as is often the case in later stages of Parkinson's, using PEG, um, the commercial names are Laxaday or Miralax, and it is not absorbed, it is not addictive, and you can take up to four doses a day for this to be effective. It is tasteless and odorless, and you can put it in any drink or on top of food. And in addition to this, because the PEG is to just increase the absorption of um, water into the gut to make the stool softer, you can take Senecot to stimulate the bowels to improve the contraction um, if you are finding that, yes, everything is soft, but you just cannot contract to have a good bowel movement. Now, I spoke earlier about existential distress. And you may wonder, what is this term? Well, this is, occurs uh, when people are starting to ask the questions, why has this happened to me? How can I go on? And how can I find meaning in life? 
And for many of you tuned into this webinar, you can probably think back to several times throughout your course of Parkinson's disease where you had these questions, where you had that despair. And how helpful that would be to be able to talk to someone about that. Existential distress is different from depression, where people really lose joy in things that they're doing, and they have a change in their sleep pattern and their appetite. And it often stems from an event or events that shakes one's faith in the logic of the world. So again, hearkening back to that North American narrative where good things happen to good people. Therefore, bad things happen to people who aren't so good. Um, and how damaging that is because you think, I'm a good person. Why do I have this illness? I've led a healthy life. Why is this happening to me? And what's the point? I did everything the doctor said, I went to the support groups, I did the exercise classes, I take my pills faithfully, and yet my illness progresses. Dealing with existential distress is important because um, if it's not addressed, it is hard to have the motivation to do the things you have to do when you have a chronic illness. Really having Parkinson's disease is like having a full-time job. And so I think that um, dealing with ex existential distress is, requires more time, more patience, and more skills than most physicians have. Um, and so I would speak to a spiritual care practitioner, or if you are connected to your religious group, to speak to your pastor, priest, your rabbi, your imam. Um, speaking to a psychologist with experience in chronic illness can be helpful. And also your local palliative care team, if they are open to neurologic patients, seeking a referral to them can be very helpful. And now I'd like to talk about some tools that you can use on your own at home um, with your computer. This is a neat little card game, um, but it's also present on the internet through the codaalliance.org. And here is the link. And this is what you're going to see. And what it um, allows you to do is uh, put values on what is important to you in your health care, what is somewhat important, and what is less important. And so it's useful to go through this because then you can decide what things are important to you when you receive health care and what things um, you're going to put a priority on. There are some questions that are about end of life, but it, they're really about who do you want to have around? Who do you want to share information with? Who do you want to be involved in decision making? And this can help you in formulating advanced care directives. And so I've heard from physicians, advanced care planning should only be done at the end of life. But when you ask the public what they think about advanced care planning, 90% think it's important to talk to, about their loved ones and their own wishes for the end of life. But less than 30% have done so for themselves and their family. 60% don't want their family burdened by tough decisions for them in the hospital. Yet 56% have not communicated their end of life wishes to their family to help them with those decisions. 70% prefer to die at home, but 70% of uh, North Americans die in the hospital, a nursing home, or a long-term care facility. 80% of people want to talk to their doctor about end-of-life care, but less than 10% of people have discussed end-of-life with their doctor. And 82% think it's important to have their wishes in writing, 
but 23% have actually done it. And so despite the doctor's reluctance to talk about this, the public wants to talk about it. And I think there's a good reason to do it sooner rather than later because this was a study of approved forms in Canada and how hard they are to understand. So we took all the approved forms for advanced care planning in Canada and the recommended reading level for health information is grade 8. You can see that there are only two provinces that meet that recommendation, the rest all exceed and greatly exceed. The figures are very similar for the United States as well. And so why is that important? Because even people who have normal memory and thinking and just feel that they're not as sharp as they were a few years ago had impaired decision making. Because these forms are complicated, because the concepts are abstract and uh, challenging. And so it's important to make these um, decisions early and have the conversation early. And you can always change your mind in the future. And so I always tell people, who should have advanced care directives? Am I talking about this to you just because you have Parkinson's disease? In fact, no. I would say everyone over the age of 18 or at an age for consent in your state or country should really be thinking about advanced care directives because having also providing a lot of hospital um, care for people in the hospital with acute illness to see the family struggle with these decisions is so sad. And frequently when they haven't had the conversation, they say, I'm not sure I'm doing the right thing. And they doubt themselves. Um, there are forms that are readily available in, on the internet. For example, Five Wishes is a legally recognized document for advanced care planning um, in the state of Maryland and in fact in uh, 43 states in the United States is recognized. So you can go to this website, fivewishes.org. And the five wishes concern the person I want to make care decisions for me when I can't, the kind of medical treatment I want or don't want, how comfortable I want to be, for instance, some people say, I absolutely do not want any pain. And other people would say, I've had bad experiences with pain medication. I would rather put up with the pain in order to be cognitively clear. How I want people to treat me and what I want my loved ones to know. So in conclusion, um, Palliative care is really appropriate for any stage of Parkinson's disease. And when we're addressing symptoms for people with Parkinson's, we should always think of non-medication approaches first. People with Parkinson's should try to use their medications as prescribed. We should remember that movement helps a lot of symptoms and that thinking about values can help cope with existential distress and that advanced care plans should be completed by everyone. Thank you. Dr. Miyazaki, that was a fantastic presentation. I really appreciate it. I was, uh, um, found it uh, incredibly informative and really detailed. I think you covered a lot of uh, potential questions that came in. And I, I think it's really, important to emphasize, uh, and it can't be done enough, that when we talk about palliative care, and I, I love your slide about uh, palliative care, is not hospice care. Um, it's not the same. Um, because it really sounds from your discussion that you know, this is something that uh, should be perhaps um, intertwined into uh, standard of care. Would you advocate that? I mean, because it sounds like from the understanding of palliative care is the 
uh, when you deal with a chronic disease, you're always working to manage symptoms. And for a disease like Parkinson's, where we don't have uh, yet uh, a way to stop the disease, a way to modify the progression of the disease, um, is it not um, always palliative care from the, the minute you get diagnosed? Uh, so, Jim, some people have facetiously said that, that, well, then all of Parkinson care is palliative. I, I do view that the palliative care philosophy is really the best practice of medicine. You know, if we go back to that slide about um, what palliative care does and its principles, it is about not just looking at a single symptom, which when I went through my movement disorder training, it was all about movement, but looking at the person as a whole and looking at the family and how the patient and the family are functioning. And so I and other people who have embraced palliative care and neuropalliative care is becoming a huge movement now. I think we're reaching a tipping point. Um, that people are starting to realize that much of uh, any specialty is really about those holistic principles and that we need to be doing a better job at that. And maybe that's why there's a lot of discontent in traditional medicine is that many, many people aren't embracing that or they don't have the skills or they feel they don't have the skills to provide that. And so I would agree that palliative care should really be, um, in, in my opinion, should be part of any movement disorder program, that um, having people who are really committed to it, not just saying, here's where we put all the people with advanced Parkinson's disease, but that we have a team of people who are trained and skilled in advanced Parkinson's and related disorders to provide care. And, and my commitment to my patients is that I will provide care for them until the end of their life or until I stop practicing, whichever comes first. Um, but I, I think to commit to that is is important for our patients. I agree. I mean, I think that would be a, a tremendous uh, revolution in care if we could uh, be able to engage everyone with that kind of holistic approach that um, you're you're talking about. I mean, it it does seem the way medicine should be practiced, um, really uh, taking care of the of the complete individual. When we talk about palliative care, though, I, I, I imagine you still encounter. Um, uh, some pushback, perhaps from um, patients. I don't know about other physicians. How do how does one broach this subject when you have a loved one who, you know, who's been diagnosed with PD, maybe not at the early stage, but you know, maybe mid stage, and and these questions, you know, begin to uh, arise. Some of these issues you bring up arise. But what, how does that conversation go from your perspective, and how would you suggest a, you know, a loved one talk to their um, uh, to their their uh, you know, the, the person that they love who has Parkinson's? Um, so when uh, – I'll, I'll give the example from our program because we have an intake every morning and we're going over all the patients and their symptoms for all the physicians um, with the multiple disciplines. And it's often the nurses or the PT, a physiotherapist or the occupational therapist who says, I think this person would benefit from palliative care. And um, because we have this team intake and we're often seeing patients on the same day, um, the patients of the family often get the message several times in that day. And we all have a different way of approaching it, but it is about um, talking about symptoms and who is the best team to address those symptoms and whether there are other things that can be done to help their symptom burden. Um, and I often uh, tell people that palliative care is, is not about death and dying. 
palliative care is about living well now. And I think that's the message that needs to get out. And that's the message that when, when palliative care is really practiced at its best, that they embrace and that they take to every encounter, they take to every specialty that they work in. It's about living well now. How can we relieve your symptoms now so that you can do things, so that you can meet your goals, whatever they are, if we can achieve that for you? So, so you know, so when you talk to people, and I appreciate, you know, coming from the clinician standpoint, that, that conversation can be easy, but if you see, you know, um, in the U.S., we just had Thanksgiving uh, last week, and and uh, you know, a lot of families come together, and you, and you see um, relatives you haven't seen in a while, and maybe you've seen how they're how they're doing or how uh, well or not well, and and I can envision trying to bring up this issue, you know, um, you know, t telling your, your you know beloved uncle or, or you know grandfather, or what have you, that maybe they should see. Um, a palliative care expert, and you know, it still has that connotation uh, in the in, as you have worked to to, uh, to dispel about hospice, about being end of life, and people say, you know, I'm, I'm not dead yet. So, do you, um, is there is there you know the resources on online? Is it these tools you provided are are, is there, are they a way with which to begin to to, to initiate that conversation? Um, you know, the, going through the, the card deck with Go Wish, or you know, thinking about um, even the five wishes, uh, so the people began to start you know thinking about that approach. Or is it, or is it simply you know, uh, again you know thinking that we talk about the symptoms that a lot of people are experiencing, perhaps it's the pain or the you know existential um, uh, issues, is it establishing that uh, a, a more robust care team uh, that can uh, help them with it, and, and not even using the word palliative as part of the process. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so there, this is part of the debate about what we call ourselves. And one palliative care physician said to me, you can call me a purple bear. I don't care as long as they come to see me. Um, and so uh, that's why we have our clinic called Complex Neurologic Symptoms Clinic. Even that makes people say, oh, I'm complicated. They don't like that. <laughs> but we've tried to sort of soften that so that um, they understand that there's, like, their symptoms are complex and they're often interrelated. And if you relieve one, you might make another one worse, like the example of pain. So um, one size does not fit all in anything in medicine, generally. And so for some people, the right approach is to go over the non-motor symptoms questionnaire or the in Edmonton symptom scale um, and see what their symptom burden is. And if their symptom burden is high, then that is someone who would benefit from palliative care. And just focusing on the symptoms and saying, look, you've answered this, and a lot of your answers are 7 to 10 on that scale. And that seems like you're really suffering. And maybe there are better ways of addressing that suffering. For other people, it's going to be about facilitating that advanced care uh, planning or advanced directive planning uh, conversation. And some people want to know. Uh, so an example from my clinic is I, I as part of our uh, clinic flow and the second appointment we talk about it and we just say do you have a plan and this one woman said oh, I want to talk about it and her son crossed his arms and stood in the corner and said she doesn't want to talk about that and I said but she just said she does and he said no she doesn't she doesn't know what she's saying she doesn't want to talk about that so you can meet resistance not from the person with Parkinson's, but often from the family members to have this conversation. And I think we have to focus on what the person with Parkinson's themselves is ready for and what they need at that time. So um, there are many ways to approach highlighting what a palliative care team can be. 
But again, I would say that um, for it to be truly effective, it can't be someone just slapping up a shingle saying, I'm a palliative care provider. But it has to be someone who really has this uh, team-based approach to providing the palliative care. And in um, all of the medical subspecialties, there is a movement now to be better at teaching these principles and philosophies to our trainees so that when they go out and practice, they will at least be able to start some of these conversations and facilitate um, people accessing the appropriate teams when it's past their skills. Yeah, I think that's a really good point is being able to identify uh, when to refer to uh, the professionals uh, who really have that, um, that knowledge um, to help individuals. When we talk about, uh, you know, the, the care team, we, you know, also clearly talking about um, family members. And I just want to highlight to our audience that on the, on the screen right now is, a, is a, um, our Caregiver Summit, which is coming up on December 1st. Um, it's going to have a live event that we'll have in, in Phoenix, Arizona. And this is something that, uh, you know, we're very grateful to our presenting sponsor, Arcadia Pharmaceuticals, for happening because what we're going to be able to do is provide uh, opportunity for people to watch it live at different satellite locations. And people can go to our website at parkinson.org um, forward slash summit uh, in order to find more information about how they can register for a satellite event or maybe even potentially setting up their own through um, um, a, uh, a support group. Um, and, you know, really recognize that these, these family members are important and it's interesting how that they uh, can um, play a role in forwarding people to these tools and, and whatnot. And, and one of the questions that comes through is actually not from a um, a family member, but from an allied health professional in Wisconsin. And they're asking about the five wishes um, for helping with advanced care directives. And they're asking, uh, you know, uh, should something you bring up, is it uh, appropriate for someone with uh, out the eighth grade uh, educational level, someone who has less than an eighth grade educational level? Does that meet your criteria? Um, as you, you know, you brought up all the different provincial, um, uh, uh, the, 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 readability score for the provincial uh, advanced planning uh, directive ones, but does the five wishes one? Uh, meet the five criteria? wishes is, is a, a very straightforward form, and so the readability is acceptable, and it's probably why it's been embraced so widely um, by uh, by the, uh, many of the states in the United States. Um, and there was a, a neat story that they have on their um, a website that uh, one woman had filled out her five wishes form and she wanted to talk to her family about it and her children just did not want to hear it and so at Thanksgiving she put her completed form she photocopied it and she put it on everyone's dinner plate and she said until you read this nobody's having turkey <laughs> And so I think it, it does, you know, bring to uh, the fore that sometimes it's the person with Parkinson's who wants to have this conversation, but the family isn't ready to have it. And, it, you know, I've seen all sorts of variations and permutations, and that's why it's multiple different approaches, um, continuing to invite people to explore these topics, not forcing people to do it, um, and trying to bring them the help when they need it at the right time. Uh, and I think that the Parkinson Foundation has done such a great job at advocating for this kind of team-based approach, um, certainly for launching the palliative care program at the University of Toronto that has now become a movement. Um, and I hope that every center of excellence will one day have a palliative care team, a real palliative care team, and that we will be leading the way for all movement disorder centers in the world. That, that would be fantastic. Um, I, and yeah, I, I think it's something that as we work to make lives better. Um, uh, as our motto that uh, hopefully we can we can achieve. 
Um, you know, so uh, uh, some practical questions, if, if I can, because um, we've been, you know, dealing with some um, getting big picture issues holistically. Uh, you know, some questions that are coming in uh, from our listeners are, you know, they're excited about uh, what you're talking about with a, the with a palliative care approach. How do they find places that offer real palliative care? Is it, is it something they talk to their movement disorder neurologist about or their neurologist and, and have them try to, to buddy up with uh, someone who's, you know, palliative care background? Or, or is, it, is there a, a centralized uh, a place to, to, to find this information out? Um, so palliative care uh, can be available at places that have a neuropalliative care specialist. So these are neurologists who have taken um, ex one year of extra training in palliative care in the United States. In other countries, there are different criteria to be a palliative care specialist. And these are neurologists who can provide palliative care and are often practicing in a palliative care group primarily. So they would be able to provide palliative care for people with Parkinson's. The other um, option is to ask your movement disorder specialist, if you are seeing a movement disorder neurologist, if their center has a palliative care program. And some centers are starting palliative care programs or they have an advanced Parkinson's disease group that will assume care for uh, patients. And many of them have undergone this, uh, the allied um, team training program. Um, realistically, the number of people who are providing uh, a palliative care program in the United States is fairly limited and it tends to fluctuate with the neurologist who is willing to dedicate their time because palliative care is the prototypic slow medicine. Um, so uh, cardiologists always think neurologists are slow, but a neuropalliative care appointment is even slower still. And that's because these conversations are weighty and you cannot rush them, um, and there cannot be the stopwatch to move on to the next patient. So um, it is challenging to find a neurologist who is skilled at these conversations and at gathering a team to provide the care, as well as someone who is dedicated enough to provide the ongoing care. But I think if patients start providing that uh, patients and family members start providing that demand for a palliative care approach, that people will start to bring this forward to their movement disorder neurologists and start to ask, why doesn't our state have that? Why doesn't our program have that? And um, I think that will provide the biggest motivation for people to move forward and really have uh, excellent palliative care available for our patients. And I think it, you're right. It's the only way we're going to be able to change the system is from the, the people who actually use it uh, and what they demand in order to do. Um, I think that's really uh, probably the best way to do that. You know, um, you know, we brought up some issues that um, of the symptoms that people um, are experiencing that that are the common ones that are addressed in palliative care, and, and one of them was pain. Um, and I know that in in your country, in Canada, that there's been uh, a, an experiment uh, underway now with the legalization of marijuana. Uh, is that something that you see, uh, um, and it's somewhat accessible here in the United States, depending on the location, as a uh, potential uh, treatment for, for pain. Uh, what role do you see that in, in the kind of the, in the, the many of these issues that you uh, bring up that people with uh, end stage or advanced stage Parkinson's are experiencing? So, um, uh, Dr. Breck, you bring up a question that is asked virtually every clinic and sometimes every single appointment um, is about the use of cannabis in Parkinson's disease. Um, although Parkinson's disease is considered a diagnosis that allows the medical use of, of cannabis in some states. There is, in fact, no evidence that it provides benefit for pain. And when you look at other traditional treatments for pain, uh, in fact, 
the number of people who will respond to cannabis for pain is significantly lower than things like antidepressants or anti-seizure medications, which are another approach to pain management. And further, although many people um, say that they are getting pure CBD oil, most of the CBD preparations do have some THC, which is the centrally active and cognitively changing um, uh, component of cannabis. And these agents can cause people to be delirious. And that means um, confused, not as cognitively clear, and that this can fluctuate. There is a report in the Canadian Medical Association Journal of a patient who actually developed hallucinations after the use of a synthetic cannabis that was regulated and had an actual dose um, so people knew what, what this woman was taking and it was prescribed under her a family doctor's direction, and she developed hallucinations that did not go away despite stopping the cannabis. So it can tip people over potentially from being cognitively clear and functioning to not functioning well. And given that cognitive impairment and Parkinson's disease approaches 70 to 80 percent depending on um, which literature you read, this is a risk that many people are not willing to undertake. And so I think it's important for people to be aware of the information um, as, as well as the potential benefits, but the potential risks. Yeah, those risks sound very real uh, and severe. So I, I think that's, uh, that cautious approach is, is, is really warranted. Um, I think too often uh, people are associating access with efficacy when it comes to the medical marijuana and something I think that uh, the foundation plans to address uh, moving forward. So um, we're coming to the top of the hour. Uh, I want to let our listeners know that there's a survey online um, right now that's on their screen if they want to, uh, to um, uh, fill it out and uh, provide uh, feedback uh, for Dr. Uh, Miyazaki and, and for this uh, particular expert briefing. That's uh, something we utilize and, and provide um, to our uh, presenters and use it to improve our program. So I encourage everyone um, to do so. Um, also want to let people know that uh, if there are uh, topics uh, you know, that were brought up you want to listen to again, that we'll have an archive of today's uh, expert briefing made available beginning next week. So that's Tuesday, December 4th. And you can go to parkinson.org in order to, um, uh, to, to download and, and listen to uh, Dr. Miyazaki again. Um, uh, next uh, webinar is going to be in January in the new year, and we're going to have um, Dr. Ronald Pfeiffer from um, Oregon Health Sciences University and one of our centers of excellence um, talking about non-motor symptoms and uh, what's new uh, regarding Parkinson's disease. So, Dr. Miyazaki, if I may have a, a final question from you, uh, if you have, have the time. You know, one issue that's come up is we talk about this uh, as palliative care. Um, we, we can't separate it from hospice. Um, when does one make that transition between thinking about palliative care to hospice care um, as we talk about uh, these end-of-life uh, changes that people experience? Uh, so within the United States, for um, people who uh, receive Medicare, the hospice uh, availability is in the last six months of life. And the services available at that time are highly variable depending on where you live and the hospice that you become enrolled in. Um, and so at the minimum, it provides equipment in the home. It can provide day programs. It can provide a visiting nurse of varying frequency. I've heard everything from once a week to once a month. And um, the Nurse will also have access to the hospice director who is responsible for all the patients who are enrolled in that hospice. Um, so uh, when someone is in the last six months of life, then they would be eligible for hospice care in the United States. In other countries, it's highly variable um, with everything from in uh, New Zealand and Australia where there's 
uh, much greater accessibility to palliative care, and they have hospice as well, but there is no limit to the access uh, to palliative care. It's really according to need. To Canada, where many provinces have uh, less than three months life expectancy in order to access um, inpatient hospice uh, services. So it is highly variable and people need to um, ask their physicians when they would be eligible based on that country's uh, criteria for accessing hospice or palliative care. Uh, thank you very much. And you bring up a really good point. Uh, when we talk about uh, the reach of your talk, uh, we have 1,600, uh, over 1,600 listeners, 28 countries, um, and uh, as well as Canada and the United States um, who are there. Dr. Miyazaki, thank you very much for your time today. It was uh, uh, wonderful to hear from you. Thank you, Jim. And to everyone out there, uh, thank you for listening, and I look forward to speaking to you again in the new year. Bye-bye.